Students, I think, would benefit from choosing SWAC because it gives them an opportunity to get involved at a more hands-on level earlier in their career. Students choosing to come to SWAC benefit from having opportunities at the freshman and sophomore level to get involved in research that can carry them forward in their career while still maintaining the same academic rigor as they would experience at, at a four-year institution. The day in the classroom in physics and engineering starts out as sort of a conversational approach to the material that we're looking at, whether it be solving rocket science problems, whether it be designing bridges, whether it be designing electrical circuit systems. It's usually a conversational approach that leads to a lot of questions. I always tell students if they're doing science well, they'll always leave science class with more questions than they got answers to begin with. And that's to drive the intellectual curiosity of the students. And that's what I try to do, making things interactive as possible and letting them foster that curiosity and develop those critical thinking and teamwork skills that they need to succeed as they go forward. You're dealing with a class in physics that is typically between 10 and 20 students. That gives you plenty of time to interact, ask questions, you get more direct responses from the instructor. And SWAC being a small enough school, there are instructors that you will see a number of times, so you get to develop sort of a rapport with your instructors and truly do become more like mentors than they do become teachers. The biggest thing it brings is a sense of opportunity. It gives us a chance to revisit how our curriculum works. It gives us a chance to incorporate new ideas, new equipment, and it also provides the students with ample opportunity for new projects and new developments in terms of research. The physics and engineering programs at Southwestern are a great way to begin your journey in a professional STEM career. Welcome everybody and thank you for coming to tonight's lecture. Uh, we're excited to have Dr. Fisher here from the University of Oregon. Dr. Coiner, um, our lead here at the Physics and Engineering Department at the college will be here in just a minute. Um, my name is Crystal Hoffer and I am our Oregon, Oregon NASA Space Grant Consortium PRISMS Project Coordinator. Um, I assist Dr. Coiner with various things to the department and um, the Space Grant has uh, very much uh, helped us out at the department with um, being able to provide various resources and funding um, to help our department continue our work. We have an amazing uh, team of student researchers called SPEAR and they have done such a great job this year um, and in the, the past school year on working on various projects. Um, I wanted to take a minute to kind of talk about a little bit about that just for a second. Um, they are searching for micrometeorites and asteroids. And um, with this uh, PRISMS project, we also recently have been able to reach out to our local K-12 uh, educators and help them with some STEM resources and even visit some classes recently and hopefully have some of the kids over here soon to check out our physics lab and do an activity together. So um, with that said, I wanted to introduce Dr. Aaron Coiner and he will tell you a little bit about tonight. Thank you. As, uh, as Crystal said, I am Dr. Aaron Coiner. I'm the, I'm the Associate Professor of Physics and the engineering program lead here at SWOC. I love having these physics and astronomy lectures because it allows us to bring in, um, it allows us to, to bring in scientists from around the community and in some cases even, or even around the country to provide uh, access to science and science topics that we don't get to hear about as much on the coast. And, and this is one of those that I'm, I'm, I'm very glad to invite or to, to be able to have my friend, Dr. Scott Fisher, um, join us tonight to discuss life in the universe and the wonderful world of exoplanets. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you all. And I'm very happy to be back here. This is my third, the third time I've, I've been back to SWOC. And I was telling um, Aaron, my, my colleague earlier, that I've enjoyed 
um, all three trips, including this one. And I'm excited to, um, I think, to lead off this um, lecture series. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Aaron, for the honor of being the first, uh, the, fir the first, um, I think, external astronomer to come and, and speak and get to use this beautiful new room. It's a wonderful venue and, uh, and, and we, we, it's a chock full of, of, of looks like semi-friendly faces um, out there tonight. And, and one of the things that, that I've, I've enjoyed coming down here, the last two times I got to speak in the beautiful big theater um, here on campus. And both times it's been a great mix of, of students and folks from the community. And so thanks to both of you for coming out. I've got an interesting topic to talk about tonight. And um, as Aaron said, it's um, life in the universe and um, with a subtitle of, of exoplanets. And this is a, a lecture that um, I've um, given once or twice before. But I want to tell you right off from the bat is every slide that you see tonight is from my Astronomy 122 class up, up at UO. And um, I'm a, a, I'll tell you a little bit about me in a second, but I'm a faculty member up at UO and I, and I teach our big uh, Astro 101 classes. And these are um, astronomy classes that's for everybody but the physics majors. And, and so I'm excited to see some scientists and physics majors in here tonight. Um, but I, I'm most comfortable speaking to the big group of the non-science majors. And what I hope to do tonight is present this topic to you um, in a, at a, a public level and um, you know, with some stand up thrown in there, just you know, as, as an aside. But it is a topic that I'm, I'm personally interested in and a topic that, um, as I'll tell in a little bit, um, um, a, a topic that my students and my research group is actually doing some research on up at UO. And, and by the way, I, it's, not, it's no secret that one of the reasons I'm down here is to make at least a soft pitch to the students here um, to let them make sure that they know that there's a direct path from SWAC up to UO. And um, Aaron and I, if we've actually worked together and we have what's called a memorandum of understanding between the two universities. And that is you take the classes that Aaron tells you here. And when you come up to UO, every one of those tra class classes transfers into UO and you can start into the third year of a physics major up there. And again, I think that speaks a lot to Aaron and, and his um, outreach and, and the work that he's doing here. So Aaron, thanks for that. And thanks for bringing me down again, folks. So look, let's talk about some life in the universe. Um, I, I can't resist. Every talk I start off is what I call a pretty picture. And by the way, um, the students in my class, they know it's going to be a good day when they, they come in and sit down and they see a pretty picture up there because they know they're going to get a five minute rant about this picture. And this is a beautiful picture. By the way, this is a, oh, oh, this is a real, um, a real photo. Let me go backwards. Back, thank you. Um, this is a real photograph. There, this is not photoshopped. There is um, a gentleman named Mark, Mark Leutman um, is a crazy guy. I don't know him. I lifted this image off the web. But um, what, what Mark did is he, in the middle of the night, he climbed up to the top of uh, uh, Middle Sister. And, and then he pointed his camera towards South Sister and took this beautiful image of not just the mountain of South Sister itself, but also his beautiful eruption of the Milky Way just coming out right from the top of South Sister. And I just, oh, I just love that imagery and of the beautiful disk of our galaxy of the Milky Way uh, contrasted by the mountain and some of the glaciers up there. There's a few other things you can see. He happened to catch a meteor that happened during this camera. And by the way, I read um, this is a, a 60 second exposure that he took with his camera. So he had a tripod and a camera he set up there, you know, about a 60 second exposure. And interestingly, um, uh, for good and for worse at some, at some level, you can also see Eugene. And that's Eugene right there. And there's the glow of Eugene. And that's actually the glow of Portland. And it's a, a double-edged sword. And by the way, this is Ben, the glow of Ben Dorgan over here. And so, you know, of course, this is that we're seeing is, is sort of what we would call light pollution, which is not necessarily the good thing, but not the, not the topic of this talk or to, to, to besmirch this fine image that Mark took. But um, again, just to let you see that we can, uh, we certainly have um, some light pollution here in Oregon, but later on, I'm going to make a case that we actually have some of the darkest skies left in the contiguous 48 states. And we should be real proud of that. And that's a resource that um, I am very keen on conserving. And so, all right, a pretty picture, beautiful Milky Way. We got some Earth stuff, um, but we're going to talk about some other stuff tonight. But ultimately, my goal, I have one simple goal. And that is to give you a scientific view into your universe that you inhabit. It turns out everybody sitting in here, I think everybody in here is human. Yeah, okay. Everybody sitting in here tonight is part of the universe. And, and, and what I like to do is to try to, to give you a, a sort of a scientific peek in there in a gentle sort of way, uh, in, in a gentle sort of introduction. And this is, again, is just another uh, beautiful photograph of the Milky Way. This is an observatory I used to work at at Hawaii. I'll tell you about that in a second. And again, just the expanse of the beautiful Milky Way stretching across the sky. Interestingly, a little bit of light pollution from a town called Hilo, Hawaii. 
you know, a little town called Kao. But those towns are, are suppressed under the clouds. And it turns out that astronomers, there are things in life astronomers hate, clouds, <laughs> right near the daytime. Okay, and it turns out also, no, daytime's okay. But, um, but clouds we don't like very much, except in this one particular case when the clouds are underneath the observatories and can help suppress any of the light from the towns underneath them. And so, so let's see if we can give you a little view, uh, a scientific view into the universe tonight. But I gotta tell you, Keith, right from the beginning, um, why do I like doing this so much? And I, the truth is, is I think science is cool. I think we all know it. I, of course, anybody who came down here to hear me talk tonight knows it, that, that science is cool, but sometimes it gets scared out of us. And that, that scaring normally happens around, oh, middle school or something. And, um, but I would like to argue with all you and make a case that we're all astronomers. Everybody, every one person in this room is an astronomer because astronomy is deeply embedded in our lives so deeply embedded that we don't even realize it so much anymore. But look, when, when do we sleep and when are we active? When the sun is in the sky. And what, has, what, has, what determines that? How the earth rotates on its axis. You know, how do we tell time? <laughs> same, same, what's high noon? By the way, the, the definition of noon is not just when your clock says 12.00 on the, on, the, on the clock face, but that is when the sun is directly south of the position you're at is called astronomical noon. And by the way, your birthday, even as fundamental, and I see some folks who um, of various ages in here, somebody who only had a couple orbits and then a few of us may have a few more orbits than others. And, but how do we even tell how old we are is how many orbits we've made around the sun. And I just wanna remind us about that so much. We might not think about that um, so often, but, but, but astronomy is deeply embedded um, in our lives. And that's why I like to say, that I think we're all astronomers. And I, I'd also like to make a case, um, you know, for everybody in the room, but maybe the students in general, a little astronomy knowledge goes a long way, people. And, and you didn't know you were gonna get a homework tonight. You're gonna have a pop quiz and a homework before this is all over. And your homework is, is simply this. I want everybody in here, including the married folks and the non-married folks, and they, when we don't know it's complicated folks, I want you to take, go out and get a blanket, some beverages of your choice, you know, turns out Oregon is known for wine and beer and good water, things like that, beverages of your choice, a nice, dark, clear sky, and a significant other. That significant other might be a hard part, but find one of those, and take, and get out and take that combination out and take your significant other out under the dark sky some night, wow, put, your, put your blanket down, get your beverages of your choice out, and share all the knowledge I'm going to share with you tonight. You're going to have to trust an old, tall, skinny guy. If you do it right, it works out for everybody. Just, you know, just, just trust me, you know, you do it right, share it right, you might even get a smooch before it's all over. And so look, use your astronomy power for good is, is what I'm saying. Let's learn some astronomy tonight and take it out there and put it to good use. And, and, uh, and, and I'm telling you, it works out. So, oh, we get to talk about my second favorite topic, me. <laughs> I, I'm only half joking about that. I'm about one third joking about that, actually. But look, I like to show this slide at the very first day of class of of my class also, because I want to give the students some context. I mean, and who is this guy up there? And by the way, Aaron will vouch for me. He knows that I'm actually me, but um, I, I did something neat. And here's something I want to say to the students is I was you um, some number of years ago, where N is now 30, which is kind of disgusting to think about. But about 30 years ago, I was a community college student at a community college in Florida called Lake Sumter Community College. And I got a two-year degree, an AAOT, and then um, I got to spend a year as an exchange student. I went to live in a country that doesn't even exist any longer, West Germany, and, and um, lived in Germany for a year and came back and enrolled in the University of uh, Florida, which is the exact analog of the University of Oregon, a big flagship university. Uh, but I am a state school boy. And, and I went and I am, and I just think it's really important to let my students and particularly this, the students here and everybody here know that, um, that SWAT can set you up to do some great things. Now you got to reach out and get it. You, know, you got to go get it. But um, this is a, and in, in particular, I find this is an excellent institution as a feeder school. And then I had, I had one, I had a career before I came to UO. I was a, I was what was called a staff astronomer at a large telescope. And it turns out this, tel it was a, this telescope right here, this guy right here, the Gemini Observatory, which is out on top of Mauna Kea out in Hawaii. And, and yes, I know it was terrible. I had to live in Hawaii for 11 years. Mm. And somebody has to do it. And I, I, I take the hit for us. 
But I did a lot of interesting stuff out there. Um, but it turns out that, um, that I also, um, um, did, you know, I was an outreach scientist, which means I got to do a lot of interesting talking to the public and, and K through 12 and the type of outreach that Crystal and Aaron are doing here. And then I did something kind of neat too. Um, but right before I came here, I lived in Washington, D.C. for three years, where I worked at a place called the National Science Foundation. And that's the arm of the federal government that funds astronomy. And so I got to, I got to hand out $15 million a year in grant money. And let me tell you, if you want to be a popular guy, hand out $15 million a year in grant money. I was even more popular than I was in high school. That was a very low hurdle to jump. But anyways, it, 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 it worked nonetheless. But the point being is that I got to um, read some of the best proposals that were submitted by astronomers all across the country and a um, glean all of the, not the actual information that they were going. But a lot of the programs that I worked on were also had educational components. Again, outreach to, to um, underrepresented groups, outreach to, to community colleges. I funded a lot, I funneled a lot of money to different community colleges around the country in my purview, but I was always very proud of that. So anyways, what, 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 what happened here? So I worked, I worked for about 15 years or so at these big telescopes, some of the biggest telescopes in the world. Then I did this three year uh, stint at Washington DC. Um, but then I did something really neat. I, um, I, I, I discovered Eugene, Oregon. And I was moved, I was ended my position in Washington and I was heading back to Hawaii and I heard about this job in Oregon. And I thought, well, that sounds great. And, um, and so I went and applied and darn it if I didn't meet the duck and, and, and everything went well and they ended up hiring me back in 2012, 10, 10 years ago, believe it or not, it was, my, was my first year. But I'm proud to say that my relationship with the duck has deepened over the years. And, and this is a, a photograph that was taken at a, at a football game pre-COVID, as you, as you might imagine. Um, and I was a guest coach. I got invited to be a guest coach. And that means you get to spend the whole day with your student athletes, which is very interesting to learn it's what goes on there. And you got to watch a football game from the field, not in the stands with the common people. The students, by the way, I'm only picking because that's the student section. And, and, and so, but it was really neat. And, um, and the, point, the point of all this is, is that I, I'm a proud duck. Um, I'm now very, very proud. I've got my bachelor's degree and PhD from UO or UF, and I'm now a, a proud duck up, 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 up in Eugene, um, you know, in, in, you know t teaching astronomy and doing a lot of another need. One thing that's um, particularly relevant for everybody in the room, and especially the students, is I'm also the director of Pine Mountain Observatory. Pine Mountain is a, an observatory that's owned and operated by UO, and it's about 30 miles east of Bend, Oregon. And why that is relevant, more relevant than ever to everybody in this room, is just this summer, we have finished completing a robotic telescope, building a robotic telescope up at Pine Mountain that we can now control through the internet. And I've already talked to, to Aaron, and we're I'm going to come back in the spring, and we're going to do my fourth installment here. And we're going to do it in the evening, and we're going to sit down, and we're going to do some remote observing. From this room, we're going to log on and observe with the telescopes up there from right here. So um, put a date, put make a date, um, save that we don't know when the date is yet. Uh, stay tuned for that. But in you know, sort of you think May, May in the spring, um, I'm going to come back down here. And we're going to um, we're going to we're going to um, hook up with Pine Mountain and do some observing from right here. Um, and that's and I want that to be relevant to the students too, because there are ways that we might be able to get you all involved with some observing programs um, up in Eugene. And, and so please keep that in mind. And again, to forge a deeper connection between the institutions is something I'm really stoked about. All right, enough of that preamble stuff. Let's uh, crack my knuckles. Let's actually talk about life in the universe. And this is, a, is, is what I like to call a scientific Photoshop. Certainly, this is not a real picture. You know, this is many individual photographs that have, that have been overlaid with each other. And there's some, some nice graphics on here. But these are all real pictures. These are, these are photographs that were taken by various telescopes. And, and just made, and our, our, our friend Jenny uh, made this beautiful graphic for us. And I like it because it just is a, an interesting graphical introduction to this idea of life in the universe. Because to me, what life in the, the one of the reasons this is such an interesting topic is that it blends together several different sciences. Of course, there's astronomy, because we're interested in, you know, maybe where these life is, but there's also biology, there's geology, as we hear in a little while, there's volcanology involved in this whole process, there's chemistry. Any science that you can study in this brand new building right here is there's a facet of that science involved 
in this study for the life in the universe. It's not just physics. It's not just bio. It's a multidisciplinary project where you've got scientists from all these different topics working together, um, making a, what I consider an, uh, a team that's even stronger than its individual parts because you have this diversity of, of, of individual knowledge and everybody is bringing their own knowledge to this project. And, and, and so this life in the universe gig, now, um, on top of the pop quiz that's coming, and, and you didn't you know, but there's also a little active, a little bit of active learning in here. Where'd y'all come from? And now look, when I asked this to my 101 class, by the way, this is a, a wonderful, nice, calm audience compared to the 350 I had um, in, in spring term. And inevitably, I asked this question and somebody from the back of the room goes, math class. <laughs> yeah, you mean you, you, you're smart, you math class. And if you if you're giving this talk to little humans about this big, you, where'd you come from? My mom. You're like, kid, you're smart. Where'd your mom come from? My grandma. You're like, you're on fire right now. Where'd your grandma come from? And that's where it kind of breaks down. About right there. You know, but, but even little kids, even the little tykes know, you know, came from a mom and grandma. There's some lineage there. Let me ask you a more specific question. Oh, well, you know that one. Okay, you got that one first. How about this one? By the way, here's the first part of the act of learning. Crack, don't crack your, I, by the way, um, I actually said crack your knuckles in front of the class and 300 people went, oh, oh, sorry, I just have the chills again. Don't do that. But if you know the person next to you, poke them, give them a poke, 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 poke yourself. Not be nice, poke yourself. Look, you, you're made of stuff, right? You like literally, you literally are made of stuff. And, and that stuff is atoms and, and molecules and different flavors of atoms and all sorts of things. But basically you're all made of stuff. And, and where'd, you, where'd your stuff come from? And again, the little kids are like, my mom? And like, yeah, sort of, you know, yeah, not, not too bad. And, but those of us who are a certain age might even think about the earth. Well, okay, yeah, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Mm, okay, there's all that stuff going on. But let me ask you an even more specific question. Where did the atoms that make you up come from? And that's a little more subtle, a little more difficult. And the little kids are just like, I, I, Pluto. You know, I don't know. The answer is always Pluto. And, but no, it's not Pluto, it turns out. And, and, this is, and, and this is the fundamental, this is the moment. And by the way, I have to, I cannot resist, out of respect for the next three or four slides, I am going to blatantly plagiarize Dr. Carl Sagan, okay? I'll give him credit at the end, I promise. But a lot of these concepts I'm about to talk about were first originated by Dr. Sagan back in the 70s. So let me show you um, a very special periodic table of the elements. And the students might remember this from their chemistry classes. And those of us who are of a certain age, don't worry so much about it. I'm going to show you a funny picture in a second. Atoms come in different flavors. And those flavors, we call them elements. And you know, and you folks might see the hydrogen, helium. This third one over here is called lithium. And in a minute, I'm gonna show you the rest of the periodic table. But the point I wanna to make to you right here on this slide is that these three elements, hydrogen, helium, and lithium, only these three elements were made in this event that we call the Big Bang. And by the way, you might see that thing called the prime event there. And that's because I actually really hate the term Big Bang. And the reason is, is that when you say the word Big Bang, we cannot help but imagine an explosion. I mean, it was a Big Bang, right? A firecracker, bang, a firecracker going off. That was not what this event was. It was some event that we humans do not yet have our minds wrapped around, but it was not a bang. And so I'm in my class, if you say the word Big Bang, minus one, right then immediately. No, I don't, I'm not quite that mean. But you do get a brownie point if you call it the prime event. Because I like to think of this was the, the prime event. This is the event that kicked off all other events. And, and, but, but for the purposes of this particular talk, the key point here is, is only hydrogen, the most simple element, helium, the second most simple element. And by the way, just a tiny little trace of this stuff called lithium. We could even scratch that lithium off and just say that hydrogen and helium were created in the prime event. And that was it. But it turns out <laughs> you're, you're made of different stuff. 
There's, there's oh, calcium in your teeth and, and carbon in the cartilage that's in, your, that's in your thumbnails, in your nose, in your earlobes, and iron in your blood. And well, wait a second, where the hell did all that stuff come from? It turns out that stuff was made inside of stars. And literally, you are star stuff. Thank you, Dr. Sagan, for, being, for, for coining that term. Every element that you see here, oh, let me hit this again. Oh, back, 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 sorry, back, back, yo, yo, yo. bang, bang, bang. All these boron, nitrogen, oxygen, neon, what do you want? Nickel, uh, rhodium, uh, technium, um, iridium, what is this one? Lead, bismuth, all the stuff. Every element except for hydrogen and helium were cooked up inside of a star through a process called fusion. Fusion is a nuclear process, and it's a process that when you have conditions of extreme pressure and extreme temperature, you can actually take atoms and smoosh them together so strongly that they will transmute into other elements. And by the way, if you ever heard of alchemy and this sort of thing, this is what the alchemists were trying to do. Never, never done it, never worked. But inside stars, fusion happens. And at the beginning of the universe, back at this moments after the prime event, the only elements that existed were hydrogen and helium. And every other element was created inside the core of a star. And I think you might already see where, where I'm going with this. But the oxygen that you're breathing right now and the iron in your blood and the calcium in your teeth, those atoms were originally created inside a star. And, and that's why Dr. Sagan coined this term star stuff. And, and, and you are literally star stuff. And here's an updated table, an updated version of, of, this, of this particular um, chart called the, called the periodic table of the elements. And what we did is we just color coded where were these elements created? Hydrogen and helium in the prime event, the Big Bang, we'll call it the Big Bang. These two, three cosmic rays, but look at the stuff that we're a little more familiar with, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, um, you know, there's magnesium, calcium, sodium. Those were created inside large stars and small stars. And as you get up to the heavier elements, these things were created inside supernova. <laughs> what you're not seeing is that any of these elements were created by geologic processes or you go down to Target and pick up some iron, you know, you can now base because it's already been created. But when these elements were originally created, the processes that created them were all astronomical <laughs> in size and scope, believe it or not. But, but all, all of this stuff inside, every, every element, except for that hydrogen and helium, were created inside stars. And that has a profound, profound, um, uh, to me, of, of, of kind of even a uh, psychological effect, knowing that all of my atoms were created inside stars. And by the way, when were they created? <laughs> Before the earth formed. So the next time somebody says to you, you're older than dirt, you go, yeah, yeah, so are you. And so are all of us. Because literally the stuff that makes you up was created before our planet earth and therefore dirt was actually created. That there's a profound sort of thing about that. And, and I, I'm, I'm already ran. I got to do a small rant. Dr. Sagan also said something. I'm going to completely paraphrase him here. Basically, we are the universe contemplating itself. You are of the universe in the deepest, most fundamental way that you can possibly. We are literally the universe because we are made of the stuff that was fused together inside stars. And here we are sitting here thinking about the universe. Well done us, yeah. And, and you know what? If you're having a bad day and you might need a purpose for life, I've heard worse than, than us being the, uni the consciousness of the universe in some way. Now we're stretching it a little bit there, but as far as we know, we're the only entities that have the cognitive power to sit back and think about the universe that we inhabit. And I just, I really like that idea. But, but, but where, how did these atoms come to be, right? I said, okay, look, there's this the idea of fusion, but how do you get from inside a star to inside, <laughs> inside your skin? Well, there's a concept that we like to call galactic recycling. 
And basically, let's start right here with this star, just like the sun. And right now, by the way, the sun is sort of uh, it, uh, middle-aged. It's halfway through its life. And inside the sun, hydrogen is slowly being fused in, into helium. And then helium into nitrogen. And there's, there's something called the nitrogen-carbon-oxygen cycle that goes on inside stars. And you can, it, don't, don't worry about that so much. But the point being is even right now today, stars like our sun are cooking up more and more of these heavy elements that are not hydrogen and helium. And at the end of the sun's life, um, um, some stars will, that are larger than the sun, at the end of their lives, they explode in these incredible explosions called supernova. And they literally blow themselves to bits. And the material that was deep inside the stars is then ejected out into the space between the stars. And there, that material becomes something called the interstellar medium. By the way, y'all have been lied to your whole lives, sorry. Space is not empty. There's actually a lot of material in between the stars. It's dust, it's, it's dust, little dust grains, just like the dust grains right here. And it's also gas, hydrogen gas, oxygen gas. By the way, there are complex molecules in space. There's methane, there's sugars, there's alcohol, the good alcohol, not ethanol, the actual alcohol. And, and, these, and there's complex molecules out that live in between the stars. And we call this the ISM, the interstellar medium, because it's the medium that's in between the stars. And, and those, that, that material lives out there in beautiful big clouds of gas and dust that you will often see pictures of as nebulae. I'll show you a picture of a nebulae here in a second. But that, that material exists out between the, between the stars and for various reasons, often those clouds will start to collapse. And as they collapse, just because this is how physics works, when you have a cloud of material that starts collapsing, it heats up and it starts to rotate. And when it does that, it forms disks. And our solar system formed from a disk of dust and gas that collapsed from one of these big glass clouds called the ISM. And then the planets form inside the disk the Earth forms, some, some magic happened. Well, it's not some magic. We're going to talk about what happened. And now, boom, four and a half billion years later, I'm sitting here talking to you about how the Earth formed. Okay, so, you know, what, what do you need to generate life? Hydrogen and a lot of time. That's, that's a really bad physics joke. Think about it. But, but it turns out that's really it. The, the Big Bang, a prime event, created a bunch of hydrogen and helium. And then since and then, boom, the story started. And a lot of physics and chemistry has happened since then. And here we are. And now look, later on, much, much later, I promise, don't worry so much about it, the 5,000 million years from now, it's going to be a Tuesday, the sun's going to end its life. We don't know about that Tuesday thing, I'm just joking. But 5,000 million years from now, the sun's going to end its life, and it's going to puff up, and about half of the sun is going to just float off out into clouds in between the stars. And that stuff's going to sit there for a while, and later on, it's going to collapse into a new generation of stars and planets. And that's this cycle. And we think that we astronomers, by the time our Earth formed, the sun is probably a third generation star. There was the first generation that lived, they died. A second one lived, they died. And our sun was formed out of the stuff from the second gen. Okay, And that's where all of the stuff that we're made out of came from, from previous generations of stars that cooked up those heavy elements. And now here we are talking about it. <laughs> oh, there's something pretty cool about that. Oh, and here's Dr. Sagan. So here's the actual quote. The nitrogen in our DNA, the calcium in our teeth, the iron in our blood, and the carbon in our apple pies was made in the interiors of collapsing stars. We are made of star stuff. But Dr. Sagan, well done, sir. You did, you did real, real good. But that is really something to contemplate. And, and, and so look, if you're feeling peckish sometime and somebody asks you, where'd you come from? Math class. No, no, don't give them the math class. Give, give them the full spiel. Say, poke yourself. Right, where'd, where'd your stuff come from? Where'd your atoms come from? It, it turns out it's a fascinating story. All right, so let's move on a little bit. And this, that, that was a bit of a setup to let you know, to introduce you to this, the sort of ages that we're going to be talking about. And so I'm going to pull a tiny little bit of geology in here just for a second. And what a really neat graph, the entire history of the Earth in one slide. And right here's today, starts over here. And then we go back one, two, three, four and a half billion years. And by the way, let's do a quick math, re math review. When you jump from one to a thousand, that's a factor of a thousand. When you go from a thousand to a million, that's another thousand. 
And when you go from a million to a billion, that's another thousand. So let me, I, I'm gonna make sure I get this right. Let's see, um, 1,000 seconds is a little bit over uh, 15 minutes. One million seconds is um, a little over a month. And one billion seconds is 32 years. So there's a lot of folks in this room right now that haven't even been around here for a billion seconds. Then there's a few of us that have been around for almost two billion. So, but, so, but so keep in mind when we, you'll hear me flip back and forth between millions and billions, that's a big jump when we're talking about. And so, so look, don't worry so much about what's going on up here, except for one thing. We know we, we have some ideas about how the earth formed. And if you look, there's a big, fairly big gap almost um, almost 1 billion years that the 1,000 million years that the earth was around before we see any evidence for life. And, and there's some good reasons for that, but I'm, I'm gonna kind of skip over that era a little bit. But, but let's zoom in on just the last one, two, three, five, about 400 million years. And we can blow that up into this big scale down here. And again, not, don't worry about the words. I'm not gonna quiz you on the words, nothing like that. But I do want to bring up one one, two, two little points. First of all, here's today, right now, the beginning, and hominids, which we are all hominids, we're apes, we're hominids, we appeared just a blink, a blink ago on this particular scale. As a matter of fact, about as far back as I can even imagine in my brain is, is, a, is sort of when the dinosaurs were around. When the dinosaurs were around, maybe all oh, 100 million years or so, maybe 200 million years is when they started. And, and so, when you keep, keep in mind that when, when I talk about life in the universe, it, it's, it, it's, it's a process that can take an extremely long time to happen. For example, we had the earth form and it was about a billion years. The earth was here before we saw any evidence for life. But once it gets going, interesting things can happen. And so look, there's a lot of words on this slide and you all can read through them, but the upshot is this, is that our current understanding of how the earth formed and how life got going, this is really sort of a one slide sort of summary. We, we, we have strong evidence that the earth formed about four and a half billion years ago, but then it was, it was you know, less than four billion years ago when we started seeing these first evidence for life. By the way, these come from microfossils and a bunch of everything, um, also carbon isotopes. But here's the sad part. We do not, and we are probably never ever gonna find the first one, bam. And you know, we just have to accept that right now. And, and it's okay though, because what we can do, even though there are gaps in what we call the fossil record, it is very clear to folks who study fossils, some, I saw some beautiful fossils on the second floor of this room, about how we can place those fossils in a sequence. And even though there are some gaps in there, you can still make a really good picture of what happened. But it's a sad thing that we're probably never ever gonna be able to get a fossil of the very, very first thing. But that's okay though, we're okay, we're okay with that. We, do, we have to kind of um, put some ground rules down for the, for the next sort of, let's say about 20, you know, 30 minutes or so of, of the talk. Life evolves through time. All life shares a common ancestry. That's a weird one. I'm gonna show you an interesting plot about that in a few minutes. And this whole idea, we might never see the first organism, but I'm gonna tell you about a really interesting um, experiment that gives us some insight of what that might've looked like. So this guy, Darwin. So um, the theory of evolution, and you might notice the little subtitle there, it says theory used in the scientific way. Um, without getting on too much of a rant, the word theory in science means something very different than the word theory in common use. You know, uh, I love my Aunt Sandy. When Aunt Sandy uses the word theory, she means guess. She means, I have a theory. They're like, no, you have a guess. But okay, you have a theory. The word theory in science is the highest honor that we can give to an idea. When, when your idea is so strong that it has been picked at, picked at by many, many, many um, experiments and it's never been disproven, you can get promoted to be a theory. And like the theory of universal gravitation. You know, the theory of relativity, the theory of evolution. These are the strongest, best understood, well-known ideas in science. That's why they get the capital T. And this theory of evolution, what that is showing that life evolves through time. And we know that through the fossil records. 
But here's what Darwin did. He didn't come up with this. But lots of folks understood evolution well before Darwin. Darwin came up with, with how evolution works. And that's through something called natural selection. And what Darwin did not know about was this thing called DNA. Boy, it would have been interesting if he did know about it. But when we discovered DNA, by the way, 100 or more years after Darwin was alive, we can now actually understand not just how natural selection works, but what causes it. And what causes natural selection are mutations in DNA. And as the DNA mutates, that puts different biological pressures on the entity, and it can fill different niches and all sorts of interesting stuff. And, and we see this. Not only can we see it, we force it in labs. You can force bacteria to evolve in certain ways. We see it in nature. You see the shapes of birds' beaks change given the climate of the year. You see this stuff out there. There's tons and tons of evidence for it. We just, we're going to, from, from here, here forth, we just accept that this happens. And, 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 and so once, in particular, once we discovered DNA, we then were able to take samples of DNA from thousands and thousands of different species and start to look for similarities and differences in the DNA. And that allowed us, and by the way, our biology collaborators and chemists and anthropologists, everybody to get together to start putting together this thing we call the tree of life. And, and I wanna pick out two things about this, um, this, particular, um, this particular tree. First of all, plants and animals are just two tiny little sticks off the every plant in the, on earth is under just that one little right there. Every animal on earth is under one little stick on the tree of life. That's impressive. I, I have to admit, before I started teaching Astronomy 101, I did not know about Thermoproteus or Methanopopulus or purple bacteria. Where's it at? Purple bacteria. Ah, purple bacteria right there. How about Flavobacteria? Did you guys know about Flavobacteria? No, no, maybe, maybe Aaron did, I'm just picking. But look at all of this huge variety of life that we have on the planet. And every animal and every plant is just two little sticks. There's the first impressive thing. And then the second impressive, the most impressive thing is root. Say hello to your great, 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 Look, this is not just some story that, the, that, that some astronomer dude has come up with. Hundreds and hundreds of scientists have, have studied the, the DNA of literally millions of different species. And you can see the roadmap between the species. And you can walk that roadmap backwards. And what you see is that the species start to converge. And the characteristics, the farther back you go, the more common the species get until you get right to the point where there was one species called root. And root is the name that scientists have given to the very first life here on planet Earth. Now, that's a kind of simplified version of the tree of life. Here's a little more complex version. And, and again, I show you this just to get a bit of a wow. And, and will you golf clap for the biologists of the world? Well done, biology. Yes. So they put this together. But you know what? Look right here. Guess what that is? Root. Right at the very center is the first one. And every species on the entire tree of life evolved from that first one. What do we know about root? Not that much. Sorry. Not a lot, but we know some interesting stuff. Has anybody seen a picture like this? Have you seen it before? Ah, we were just talking, me and this guy were talking about these beforehand. This is what's called a hydrothermal vent. And this is a photograph that was taken. Oh, oh, by the way, sorry, Mark. Yes, that's great. That's right. That's right. That's it. Yeah, hydrothermal vent. This was taken by a submarine, maybe four or 5,000 feet below the ocean, or below the surface of the ocean, by the way, where it's pitch black. So this is the lights from the submarine are illuminating the, the view. And what you can see, a hydrothermal vent is a crack in the floor of the ocean where superheated water is literally, it's, it's a geyser on the bottom of the ocean. And there's superheated water that's flowing up from underneath the surface, the, the bottom of the ocean into the water. And the water at the bottom of the ocean is generally quite cold. And so what you see, you're injecting extremely hot, not often volcanically heated water 
into an extremely cold environment. And by the way, pitch black with no light. However, you'll notice around here, there are vibrant ecosystems that exist around these hydrothermal vents. There are single-celled organisms, little amoebas, uh, lichen, these crazy little tube worms that stick their head up out of the tube worms. You know, there's seaweed, there's kelp, there's bacteria, and all of this life has evolved in an extremely inhospitable place. The bottom of the ocean, you know, no light, no photosynthesis, it's all chemosynthesis type stuff, it's all energy through chemistry. But if you study the DNA of, these, uh, of this life down here, and you start putting it into this, what you see is, is the DNA of the life that is found around these hydrothermal vents is suggestive that it is extremely simple life that might be pretty close to root. And so what we've come to the idea is, is that there is physical evidence that life likely got started around these vents on the early earth. So that's already saying, that's already, we're kind of, we're sort of, um, you know, honing in on this, on this thing. And so again, if you were taking one, Astronomy 122, I would say students study this slide because it's gonna be on the final. And because I want what you all to know and the students is when you ask a scientist, what are the necessities for life? These are what we've come up with. Water, nutrients, and an energy source. And all three of those are abundant around these hydrothermal vents. Clearly you got water, you're underneath the water. You got nutrients. Nutrients come from the rock and the dissolved rock that's around there. And you have an energy source from the superheated water that's shooting up from the geyser itself. And, and by the way, you might say, why do you need water? Because at this point in our search, we're sort of looking for life that's like us. Now, could it have, <laughs> okay, let me be careful. When I mean like us, I don't necessarily mean um, with beautiful green eyes and a strong forehead like me. But, 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 you know, bipedal, maybe, you know, but is, you know, is anybody ever really taking a careful look at a lobster? <laughs> That's some alien looking stuff, right? The eight legs and the eyes up on the stalks. And what about millipedes? What the hell's up with that? A hundred legs all working. I don't leave. anything with more than four legs is freaky. But, but look, when we say life like us, I sort of mean broadly, not like us humans. And everywhere we know so far, basically all life on earth has to have water. And that's why we're looking for the follow the water is what we wanna do. We wanna look for life that's like us, that we can recognize that's like us. Why do I find this so fascinating about these hydrothermal vents? They're all over the planet. As a matter of fact, I was saying today, just 60 miles off, which way is the coast? This way? Got it, we go 60 miles off the coast, right, right here, right from Coos Bay. We could rent a boat and go out there. And 60 miles out and 5,000 feet down, there is a whole cluster of active hydrothermal vents. And it's like, oh, go Oregon. Well done, Oregon, yes. And, and not just that, they're all over the earth. Still, 4,500 million years later, these things are still active. So the point being is that we have strong evidence that these hydrothermal vents if they exist now, they certainly existed earlier in the life of the history of the earth when things were much more violent, there's much more tectonic motion and all sorts of stuff. So we've sort of come up with the idea that A, life might um, come around or, or might generally uh, be created around these hydrothermal vents. Two, that their hydrothermal vents are all over the earth. And there's lots of places where this stuff might've happened back in the day. But let's get it astronomical on you for a few minutes. Crack my knuckles again one last time. Enceladus, my absolute favorite moon. You know, our moon's okay. It's, I think it's, it's number, this is my 16th favorite moon, our moon. And, but Enceladus is right at the top, number one. Not, 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 you know, not just for the obvious reasons that it looks cool, by the way, it's a glacier world, completely covered, but it's a moon of Saturn. It's completely covered with ice and it has jet packs. And I mean, who, I mean, how cool is that? And by the way, when you tell the little kids that the moon has jetpacks, they're just like, oh, yeah, they just they'll believe anything you say, you know? Then you tell the college students and they're like, there aren't jet, they're not jetpacks, college students, they're geysers. 
and at active geysers. And by the way, how do we figure this out? Well, um, back in, in, in the early 2000s and through the 2010s, there was a spacecraft named Cassini, C-A-S-S-I-N-I, -S -S -I, Cassini, in orbit around Saturn. And one of the biggest surprises of that entire mission were these geysers on Enceladus. And I can, I can just barely imagine the first pictures of Enceladus came in and they were like, why is it fuzzy? <laughs> you know, nobody expected there to be active geysers on this moon. So the point is this, is it's an ice covered moon with active geysers. But where's the water coming from? If these geysers are active, where is it coming from? There must be a reservoir underneath the ice. And by the way, this is why Enceladus and Europa, which is a moon of Jupiter that has a similar sort of process going on, are excellent places to look for extraterrestrial life because we can already see one of those three requirements are there, not just frozen water, liquid water. And so we know that there's, by the way, we now actually know how much liquid water is on Enceladus. It turns out that the ocean underneath the ice of Enceladus is roughly the size of the Gulf of Mexico. And so it's not just a puddle. I mean, that's, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not the Pacific, but, it, but that's still a significant amount of water. And I love the way that we, that we humans figured this out. Like I said, Cassini was the spacecraft and Cassini was out there orbiting around, um, um, orbiting around Saturn and NASA changed the trajectory of Cassini so it flew extremely close by Enceladus. And as the spacecraft flew by the moon, it could feel the gravity of the moon. And the gravity of the moon deflected the orbit of the spacecraft a little bit. I kind of like, it, it flew by Enceladus and kind of it, it didn't make that sound. That's my own sound effect. But it, it actually tweaked the orbit of, Ence of Cassini a little bit. We could measure how much it changed the, um, the, the trajectory of the spacecraft, calculate the density of the moon. We know how big it was. Now we know how much it weighed. Can calculate its density, do a few little magical math tricks. Boom. You know that there must be about um, a six mile deep ocean underneath that water, or right in the Southern hemisphere. And so um, huge deal. Not only did we say, okay, boom, there's water there. There's liquid water there that is actively being jetted out of the, um, out of the, out of the, 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 uh, the, by the way, there is no atmosphere. So this is going right out into space. And then at the end of Cassini's life, um, NASA did one of the craziest things that I think I, I, I can't imagine how this ever, the, the person who convinced NASA to do this is, I don't know how they did it. At the end of the life of the spacecraft, they convinced, they, the, the astronomers convinced NASA to fly Cassini through the plumes. <laughs> they flew Cassini through the plumes. And this is what I want everybody to do tonight. What they convinced NASA to do was go home, turn the spigot on in, on your sink and take your laptop and run your laptop right underneath the, the don't, don't do that. Okay. That's effectively what they did. Cassini wasn't waterproof. They didn't, nobody thought you were going to find water out there and they flew the damn thing right through the plumes. Yeah, well done. What did Cassini, Cassini did us so right? Even with instruments that were not built to do this at all, flew through the plumes and Cassini detected these different species. First of all, lots and lots of water. By the way, carbon dioxide, there's um, methane, nitrites, sugar, C4 organics, but that word organic does not mean life. What that means is, is those are complex hydrocarbons. Those are complex molecules that have long strings of carbon and hydrogen mixed together, just like you find in the food that you eat, and just like you find in the cartilage that's in your fingernails, but that doesn't mean that we found life. But boy, is it getting tantalizing. Not only did we find the, the let me see if there's one more slide. Now it's the last one. Not only did Cassini find these, these elements that can be called precursors of life, it also found a very specific type of sand, silicate, in the plumes. And that silicate can only be created under very high temperatures, <laughs> like next to hydrothermal vents. And so we got direct evidence from Cassini. Not only are these chemicals there, but there is a very good chance 
that there are hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean on Enceladus. And if you want me, I'm feeling bold tonight. I'm going to bet you all a dollar, communally one dollar, not like the hundred of you in here, one dollar. I, my bet is Enceladus. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm convinced there's life there. Now, is it, is it little fish with lasers on their head? No, probably not. Is it lichen? Maybe. Is it tiny little microbiome, tiny little single-celled organisms? I hope. But to me, Enceladus and Europa are really excellent analogs of what's going on just 60 miles off the coast right here. Hydrothermal vents and all the, all the ingredients for life. Enceladus, best moon of all times, if you ask me. All right, do you got, do you got 15 more minutes? Are we good? Yeah, yeah, okay. Get ready. That was only fourth gear. Now we're going to fifth gear. Let's talk about some chemistry. And by the way, I'm a little bit out of my realm here. So if there's any chemists in the room, I apologize for what I'm about to do to your fine subject. The Miller-Urey experiment. Absolutely related to what we're talking about. But first sidebar, little rant. When I first saw this picture about five years ago, I was like, could, could you be an, any more of a parody of himself? An old white ball guy as a scientist. If you put a lab coat on him, it would be, you know, he would be a parody of himself. Then I learned that's actually Dr. Miller. So hi, Dr. Miller. Yeah, so, so well, well done, Dr. Miller. And he's standing in front of the apparatus that we're about to talk about. And, and, and I, I, lo I love this particular, I love this particular experiment. So what Miller Urey showed, and some folks who followed up, is that the building blocks of life form easily and spontaneously under the conditions of the early Earth. And, and, and I, can't, I can't resist, I'm feel, I'm, you know, again, this is, you're such a fun crowd. Look, this is my own rendition of how this happened. This is not how it actually went down. But let me put a little, uh, put a little um, acting in here on top of it. What I've learned is that Dr. Miller and Urey went to a conference where there were a lot of different sciences represented, not just chemistry, but there was biology, physics, astronomy. It was like an AGU, which is by the way called the uh, um, American Geophysical Union, which is a big group of scientists and any flavor of scientists is welcome to go to their meeting and start talking to other scientists. And I love this idea because every once in a while, experiments like this come out of different branches of science talking to each other. And I just have this, this, this mental image of, of Dr. Miller and Urey standing there and some astronomers come up and they get to talk and they're like, well, you know, we do chemistry and the astronomer's like, well, we study the early earth and, you know, we're trying to figure out how life got started. And then Miller was like, oh, dude, I like that. We like how life got started. I want to figure that out. And they're like, well, yeah, we're thinking about how it got started on early earth. And, 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 the, and, and Dr. Miller was like, well, do you guys, do you know what it was like on the early earth? And the astronomer's like, well, you know, we got a pretty good idea. You know, we looked at other, at other planets and we, you know, we have an idea. It was a pretty hellish place, actually. It was hot. It was an extremely thick atmosphere of primarily sulfur dioxide and carbon dioxide. Um, it was basically a volcano planet um, very early in the earth's life. This, our Earth was, at the very first, it was a lava planet. It was completely covered with lava. But then as it cooled, the crust formed. And as this crust started to form, we had massive, massive bouts of volcanism. A, a million, 10 million times stronger than we see today. And, and Miller was like, cool, you guys know a lot. And they're like, yeah, we even know the composition of the atmosphere, sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide, you know, um, and, 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 and Dr. Miller was like, have you guys ever tried to recreate that? They're like, ha, create an atmosphere. How do you do that? And Dr. Miller was like, well, we got the doodad in the lab. We got the beaker. You can put the gases in it. And the astronomer's like, what? And they're like, yeah, we got, I got a bag, of, a box, of, not a box. You know, I got a, a canister of carbon dioxide. I got sulfur dioxide. Let's mix it in there and see what happens. These stars are like, what the hell? Let's just go. And so they got the doodad out and they mixed the gases in there. And, and, and they're like, okay, now what? And the astronomer's like, what the hell if I know? And like, oh, no, no, wait, wait. What happens around extremely strong volcanic eruptions? Has anybody ever seen a picture of a massive, beautiful volcanic plume going up into the sky? What often is surrounding that plume? It has a lot to do with electricity. Lightning. 
tons and tons and tons of lightning. And the astronomers were like, well, you know, we think there was lots of lightning. And Miller was like, we got the zapper. We can, we can mix the gases together and let's put the zapper on them. And the astronomers were like, zap it up. And so, you know, Dr. Miller, they mixed, they mixed the stuff together. They, they put it in there and they zapped it. And they said, okay, now what? And the astronomers were like, I, I don't know. And they said, well, let's just let it run. And they said, okay. And so Miller, they pushed it off in the corner of the lab and they just, they mixed the stuff together and they zapped it. And I think, I think in the original paper, they zapped it for like a month, you know? And, and then they walked by the, the, the beaker one day and it was like, what? There's a bunch of black goop on the inside of the beaker. And they're like, hey, Miller, did you open the beaker? He's like, no, it's been sitting over there the whole month. It's just been zapping the whole time. And Gure was like, but it's the, the goop, there's goop in there. And like, we gotta check this out. So they stop it, they open it up, they get some goop, spread it on a, 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 a slide, and boom, look under a microscope. They're like, well, we don't see much. All right, so let's do some chemical analysis. And then they did some chemical analysis of the goop inside there. <laughs> Basically, what they found were 20 different amino acids inside the goop. And you're like, oh, Fisher, that sounds important. Yeah, it is. Turns out amino acids are what make up DNA. It's not DNA, but it's the nucleotides that start to make up DNA. And let's remember all they did. Mix the gases together, put them in the zapper, zapped, set it off in the corner, zapped it for a month and came back. Chemistry had spontaneously happened inside there. This is getting interesting. All right. So Dr. Miller calls the astronomers. They're like, you guys aren't going to believe this. There's goop. In the, there's stuff inside the, the, the zapper. And by the way, there's 20 amino acids in there. And then the astronomer's head just went, Pow! and they just exploded. And they said, what? How can this possibly be? And now, of course, they have then now went back and analyzed this and talked about the particular reactions that may have gone on. But for us, the key point is, is this happened spontaneously on its own with no external input. Recreate what we think it looked like on the early earth, this happens. And so then Miller and Urey were like, well, what do we do next? And they, of course the astronomers were like, we don't know, we've never done this before. And they're like, ah, we got an idea. Let's talk to our geology buddies. So they bring the geologists in and they say, hey, geology people, what was the early earth made of? And they said, rocks. And they're like, <laughs> And like, well, okay, what kind of rocks? And they say, well, if you go to this very specific place in Australia, and by the way, in the Scottish Highlands also, are some of the oldest rocks that we know of. These are rocks that are a little over 4 billion years old. And they're exposed. They're right there. You could literally go and chip a piece off. That's what they do. They went up. They got the rocks, crushed up a bunch of the rocks, made dirt out of them, put the dirt in, mixed the goop in the dirt, and put it in the closet for a while month or two. And then again, they walked by one day and Miller was like, yeah, we should, what's the goop doing? Let's pull it out and take a look. Pulled it out, put some of the goop on the slide, put it under the microscope, bam, that was there. This is not the original picture. This is a picture of, of another experiment. The structures that you're seeing were, were not, they, they created themselves. So this is, again, is an, is, is an example of chemistry happening on its own without input from us outside. You take the amino acids from the Miller-Urey experiment, put it in some soil, mix it together, boom. The, the, look at these little circles. Look at, look at this one. Look at that. The, what we think those are are extremely primitive cell membranes. Now, they're not cells. They're not alive. There's no nuclei, there's none of that going on, but you see this, this beginning of the cells forming, and you can also see little tiny bits of RNA. And RNA is the precursor to DNA, which by the way is in every cell in all of us has our own DNA in it. So what have we shown here is this is, I, by the way, I lifted this out of a textbook 10 years ago. Sort of five steps on the way to life. 
And now in the last 20, 30 years or so, we have actually recreated the first two steps of this five-step process. Certainly, we can easily recreate the conditions that were on the early Earth. That initial chemistry happens. Take the results of that chemistry, mix, put it in an interesting medium, and you get RNA. Now, we do not know how these steps work, going from here to here to here to there. But you know what? Well done, humans. In the last, you know, again, our lifetime, we've made great strides forward and we think understanding how life got started here on the planet. And, 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 and that, that to me is, is, is just fascinating. Now, I gotta put this in here because I got called out by a student and, and I'm glad they did. I went through the whole rant. I gave the funny thing, the zapper, the zapper. And the students were just like, oh my gosh. And then at the end of the day, a student came up after class and he's like, uh, Dr. Fisher, uh, good lecture, you're funny. Um, um, I'm a chemistry major and by the way, didn't Miller Ure get this proven? And my face was like, shh, went ashen. And I thought, oh my gosh, for the last two years, I've been teaching them something that got disproven. And so he and I went out and we looked up um, all the literature we could find about this. And you'll note, this was actually, by the way, Miller Ure was in the 60s. This was like mid 60s that they did, that they did the initial experiment. And we went out and we found a, another paper from 2017. And, and basically, um, it, there was a question about Miller Ure and, and about whether they did the right thing. And, and, and so people went back and we reproduced, we tried, we did their experiment again. And not only did we reproduce their results, folks then tweaked the composition of the gas in the, in the beaker. Like, well, it wasn't just sulfur dioxide. There was actually some nitrogen in there and there was probably carbon monoxide. And we made it a little more detailed, a little more detailed model, put it in there, zap, 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 put it in the mud, put it in the, the closet. You bring it out of the closet. They created 25 amino acids this time. Now, to me, what this is, is a beautiful example of the scientific process. miller ure did an experiment it came into question and we went back and repeated the experiment to make sure that we understood from the beginning. And that feedback loop is, is what separates science from pseudoscience. You gotta go back and check your stuff. And by the way, if these folks could not reproduce what miller ure did, you gotta throw that out. You gotta, miller ure is done. It did not hold up to the scrutiny that science brings. And you can't just keep going on that. You gotta throw it away and come up with a better idea. Now, in this case, we did not have to do that because even with a better experiment, we came up with even a better result. And so well done Miller Ure and, and well done this team to help us really understand. And you know what, go science. All right, I, I promise I'm almost done folks. So look, what have we sort of learned here? Well, we learned that, that the Earth formed out of a, a massive cloud of gas and dust from the interstellar medium. And the Earth itself existed here for, for quite, quite a long period of time, about 500 million years before any life got started. But then something happened and we feel, let me be careful, no, we don't feel, we, we, our, our understanding is, is that probably around a hydrothermal vent, the very first life what well, came into being here on Earth. And from that first life through again, through the, through the process of evolution, we now have, oh gosh, four and a half million different species or something like that um, here on the planet. And, and what, what do we need? What do we need most? We, oh, sorry, what we need, we need nutrients, energy, and liquid water. And, and so um, I'll tell you what, now if you, I, you do, hold tight, let me do extra planets. But I'm, gonna, I'm gonna kick into sixth gear now. You didn't even know the sixth gear existed. This to me, if you think Miller Ure is exciting, this is a hundred times more exciting than that. Exoplanets are planets that orbit stars that are not the sun. It's, like, it's an easy definition, but I wanna make sure that we understand that. Exo means you know, outside, exo, exit. And so these are planets that are not in our solar system. These are planets around other stars. The very first planets were discovered in the 1990s. 
And the students are like, the 1990s? Did you even have electricity back then? No, I'm just picking up so much. Yeah, so, but those of us of a certain age can remember the 1990s very clearly. And, and for us, this was a crazy thing. Because when, back in the day when I was a kid, there were nine planets, damn it. And that was it. Now there's eight. I'm just joking. Now there's 14. So I'll tell you about that later. But not a single planet outside the solar system. Not only did we not know of them, we didn't even think they were there. We thought you, that the solar system might be unique. But in the early 90s, this all changed. And every term, I started teaching this. And about every six months, I had to update the slide. Update the slide. Update, update, update. I'm going to get it for 29. See, we're getting there. And as of tonight, I looked it up right before I came here. We know, we now have hard evidence of 5,192 planets outside the solar system. And that is probably to me, other than maybe where your stuff came from, that to me is the most amazing thing that I'm gonna tell you all night. For, for any of us that are over 30 in this room, we have gone from zero planets outside the solar system to 5,200 in our lives. And for the students, it was in your whole life, just barely when you guys were, were born is when we discovered the first ones. And now, so early in your lives, we already know of 5,200. And I, 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 I'm feeling extra bold tonight. Another dollar. That's two bucks on the line now. That's like six bucks. I've been here three times. I think I made a bet with them last time, too. I got to stop this after this. All right, this is the last one. One more dollar. Ten years from now, I'm going to come back for my 30th talk. And we will know of more than 50,000 planets. God, I promise you. It might even be 500,000 planets by then. Because we've now understood, we've discovered enough of them that we can start doing statistical modeling. And, and, and basically, the current models, the current ideas suggest that every star in the sky has one planet around it. <laughs> that's, that's a thing. That is incredible. Think, and that's completely changed how the sky looks to me. Because I'll go out, maybe not tonight, it's still cloudy here on the coast, but you know, go out and look up. And 20 years ago, those were just pretty little dots up there. Now, those are pretty little dots with planets around them. This does not mean that every star has one planet. Many stars have zero. And there are stars like our own that have 14 planets, by the way. We have eight planets and six dwarf planets, in, in this, including Pluto, in, in, in our solar system now. So some planets, some solar systems have lots, some have some stars have none. But on average, one planet around every star in the sky. And that is a mind-blowing moment. And ah, yeah, yeah, we saw that kind of thing. So are, 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 are you ready for a two-minute movie? Can I show you a two-minute movie? Uh, it means that I get to shut up for a minute. So let me click this. And I think we're good. Our, our buddy Dallas got to set up up there. So boom. It's a minute 17, watch. Oh, can you hear it? Each, each little spot, each little spot is where we've discovered a planet. And watch here. Here you can see the year. Here you go. All right, I'll be quiet. This is a picture of the entire sky, all the northern and the southern hemisphere. Well done, NASA. By the way, I, 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 I'm going to say by the way 17 times. Sorry, I can't resist. Let me see if I can look right here. Ooh, this right here, you notice I circled that. 
That is where a satellite called the Kepler satellite observed. And Kepler was made for one reason, and that is to, to discover exoplanets. So right in this one little part of the sky, oh, compared that one little part of the sky, we've discovered about 2,500 of these planets just right there. And, and so um, <laughs> that's a perfect segue into this slide. How much of the Milky Way have we actually, have we actually searched for these planets? <laughs> just the little blue triangles. And that, that area that I just pointed out, that was this area right here, Kepler, or Kepler looked. And just this, that little area right there, and this little area, 5,000 planets we've discovered already. And, and, and here's the Milky Way. And by the way, where do we live in the Milky Way? We live in the Burbs. There's downtown, there's Portland, you know, down there, big city. Uh, out here, let's see, what's a tiny little town? In, in Eugene, I pick on Junction City. What, what, what's a tiny little town around here? Holly. Say, say again, Holly. Here's Holly out here. And here's where we are. We live about in the Burbs. We live about halfway between the center and the edge of the galaxy. And, and in just that tiny little area, we've already got these 5,200 planets. How big of an area is that? Turns out, I did a little scale. All right, let's take our whole solar system and shrink it down to, oh, 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 to the size of a quarter. Or this, you know, this, little, this lid right here. Take the whole solar system, shrink it down to the, to the size of a quarter. And if you did that, the entire Milky Way would be about the size of North America. And by the way, remember where we are is a tiny little quarter right here in Eugene, Oregon. Well, Coos Bay, Oregon, right here. Yeah. And, and so the entire Milky Way would be about the size of the entire North America. How much have we searched? <laughs> um, we searched the size of Lane County or Connecticut. Turns out, it turns out Lane County and Connecticut are almost the exact same size. I learned that too. We have searched a tiny, teeny, tiny little fraction of the Milky Way, and we've already discovered 5,000 planets. And this is where I, I feel that my dollar is safe with this bet. And by y'all, you're going to have to pony up 10 years from now. I'm telling you right now, 25 cents from all of you, that, um, that we, will, we will easily, easily eclipse 50,000 planets in, in the next 10 years. All right, so I think I got like one more slide. I think I'm done. Oh, oh it might be the last one. Oh, there it is. Pictures. Look. This is it. These, an exoplanet around a star that's been canceled out, an exoplanet around a star that's awful bright, and then three exoplanets around a single star, which again, we've canceled out in a funny way so we could see them. Turns out, you know, seeing these planets is real tough. Think of a, um, think of a lightning bug next to a searchlight. You know, you're trying to see something real, real faint next to something bright. So the point is, is we have actually taken some photographs of exoplanets, but that's it. Even with James Webb, all we're gonna see is a tiny little spot because they're so far away and so small, we're not gonna be able to say any detail. However, James Webb is going to be able to teach us a lot about these planets, including the composition of the atmospheres and what might be in there and could you see ozone and all sorts of interesting stuff. So, so let's see, that's it. Um, oh, this, this is the wrap up. Look. I don't think we're gonna see anything more than dots on images, but, but uh, let me see if I can end you with a profound moment. The discovery of these exoplanets has completely changed our, our, our understanding of where we live in the universe again. You know, um, when I was your age, I don't like saying that much, but when I was your age, we were the only planets in the entire damn universe. And now we know that there are billions, of, billions and billions, as Dr. Sagan would say, billions of planets out there. And, 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 and sometimes I like to think of what I call the long game. And to me, the long game is a thousand years from now, 5,000 years from now. What, you know, what is earth going to look like and what is humans going to be? And I think in, in my heart, I think it's probably a thousand years from now when humans when we will actually have spaceships that we can go between the stars. It's gonna take that long. I love Star Trek, don't get me wrong, but I think it's gonna take that long. But do you know what we're doing right now? We are making the map that future humans will use to colonize the stars. The very planets that we are discovering, we are making the map that those folks are gonna follow. And I think we should be proud of that.
This is a defining, this is a defining discovery of our time. And it was our generations right here, one, two, three. These generations right here, you see, we're the ones who did it. And, and 500 years from now, when that first take, that 700 years from now, when that first ship takes off, they're gonna be following the map that we made. And that's pretty damn cool. That's it, folks. Thank you very much. Aaron, thank you for inviting me back down. I'm love, I would love to do some Q&A and hang out for a while, um, but please don't feel that you're, that you're stuck here either.